It should be recording. Okay, great. Um, so um, I also want to share that uh, while we don't have ASL translation available, we do have um, live um, transcription and captions. So you should see a little um, button on the bottom of the square that says CC um, for live um, transcription. Um, and um, before I start, I also want to um, share and read out loud a land acknowledgement that's um, that was collectively written by my department. I'm going to actually try to share share it in two parts um, in the chat, so you can also read it for access purposes. Hold on for a second. Let's see if we can. So that's the first part, and then here's the second part. <laughs> So let me read this out loud. Um, the Gender and Sexuality Studies Department recognizes the University of California as a settler land grant institution that exists on the occupied, unceded, and ancestral lands of indigenous peoples. Our campus UC Riverside was built and is currently expanding upon land belonging to the Cahuilla, Tongva, Luceno, and Serrano peoples, and all of their relatives, relations, past, present, future. We gratefully recognize our responsibility to learn from and stand in solidarity with the original and current caretakers of this land, water and air, who also model a tradition of indigenous resistance, community survivance, and sovereignty in the face of settler colonialism. We acknowledge indigenous lands, rights, and peoples as a starting point for telling the truth about the histories of violence from which the university and its employees have benefited. We are committed to moving beyond the symbolism of this statement by centering indigenous feminist knowledge and practice in our teaching, hiring, and the broader context of our engagement with the university and local communities. So I just want to share um, that acknowledgement as we start today's event. Um, so as shared by the event description that has been um, circulated, um, our event today is um, with an incredible group of people, um, including the writer, researcher, and activist, Eric Watt, who will be in discussion with Matt Sillet, uh, who's actually a UCR um, alum, and James Quinn um, about Eric's recently published book, Love Your Asian Body, AIDS Activism in Los Angeles, University of which was published by University of Washington um, Press last year. And um, I'll actually share a code that um, UW Press also um, shared with us for a 30% discount for Eric's book um, throughout the event today. Um, so while the discussion will begin with Eric's book, which is a community memoir that centers the political activist labor of 30 Asian American AIDS activists during the 1980s and the 1990s, the conversation will actually open to these larger questions regarding queer of color genealogies that inspire multi-generational activisms, um, joy and community organizing, and the different ways of stewarding and also sharing these generational knowledges of activism, grief, and pleasure across um, queer of color communities. Um, so I just want to provide a brief bio or brief bios of our participants today. So I'll start with Mads. So Mads Le grew up in Pomona, California, a city teetering on the edge um, of Los Angeles's urban sprawl. It spills into the Inland Empire. And Mads has worked alongside and within Vietnamese and broader Southeast Asian organizing networks over the last six years in both Los Angeles, California, as well as Philadelphia and Pennsylvania. Um, now at UCLA's Information Studies program, Mads is committed to developing a community archival praxis that's rooted in a politics of love, care, and intentionality. Mads is currently thinking through critical archival studies community-based archives, disability, feminist oral history practice, queer of color critique, and critical refugee studies. And um, it's been such an honor for me to work with Mads now for um, a while, a few years. I worked with Mads um, when Mads was the um, undergrad at UCR. So I'm just so happy that we're able to continue our conversation with one another. Um, so James Quinn, he and his grew up in a desert term suburbia, Fontana, California. He is um, the son of Vietnamese refugees um, who come from the, uh, the city of Hue, uh, Vietnam. Um, James is a PhD student in community health sciences at um, the UCLA, UCLA uh, Fielding School of Public Health. Uh, his scholarly and activist commitments are to addressing the health impacts of racial capitalism, heterosexism, and patriarchy among queer Asian Americans. Um, he focuses on community well being, family, and kidship. Um, and grassroots organizing as paths to challenging systems of power. 
Outside of academia, James is chair of the board of directors of Fiat Rainbow of Orange County, or VROC, a grassroots organization that builds community and mobilizes intergenerationally, primarily with LGBTQ plus Vietnamese Americans and their loved ones through research education advocacy. And I think I actually pronounced the city incorrectly. Is it Hui or Hue, James? It's Hue, you said it's it right Hue? the first okay. time. Yeah. Okay, good, okay, great. Thank you, just wanted to make sure. Um, last but certainly not the least, we have writer, activist, researcher, Eric Watt. Um, he and his, who's the author of Love of Your Asian Body, AIDS Activism in Los Angeles, um, and the Making of Gay Asian Community and Oral History of Pre-AIDS Los Angeles, which was actually published in 2002. Um, so Eric is also the author of the LA Times bestselling um, debut novel, Swim, which came out Permanent Press 2019. So Eric has been really busy writing, um, which is about a gay um, Chinese American drug addict who must plan his mother's funeral while trying to stay sober and takes place in the San Gabriel Valley. In addition to his writing, Eric is also a freelance evaluator, facilitator, organizational development, coach in the nonprofit sector. Um, he was born in Hong Kong and has lived in LA since um, the early 80s. Um, so just a few quick things before we segue into our conversation today. I, I want to thank our co-sponsors, um, including the CIS Faculty Commons Performing Difference Cluster. I know um, Dr. Um, Donatella Galella is here who has been um, really leading this cluster and just so much gratitude to her. Um, she's also helping um, with the back end here with Zoom. Um, the Department of Gender and Sexuality Studies, the LGBT Resource Center and the Asian Pacific Student Program. So often when we share our co-sponsors, it sounds like an obligation, but I am really grateful um, to our supporters. I think at this time where we've been feeling sort of the amplified austerity measures with the university, I'm just really grateful um, for spaces like this that really support critical humanities work. So thank you. Um, so the conversation portion among our discussions will probably be you know, 50 or so minutes. And then we'll segue into a Q&A with the audience. So um, until the q and I'm just asking all of you to please keep your mics muted. Um, you can share your comments if you want to, um, but, and I will try my best to actually keep track of your comments, but we won't be able to share this until we segue into the Q&A session. And last but certainly not the least, I'm going to share um, University of Washington Press's 30% um, discount code for Eric's book. And I'll share the website for um, the, I just shared it in the chat um, and I'll share the website link as well, as well. So without further ado, I want to transition to our conversation. And I think Eric is actually going to start us off. Yeah, thank you, Crystal. Um, I'm gonna talk about lineage in two ways before we get into the really rich, I'm sure it's gonna be a really rich conversation with Matt and James. Um, everything has lineage. This event has a lineage. Um, it, it didn't start, but part of that lineage is my friendship with, with Christo. Um, we've been cheering each other on with our both our research and writing. Um, so during the writing of this book, um, we even do writing sessions together, I think at one, at one point. Um, she was working on her book, I was working on mine, and even before the book came out, okay, I think there's someone, okay, I'll say, even, thank you, even before the book came out, uh, Crystal invited me to talk about my research at UC Riverside, that was well, at least you know, probably three years ago, because it was, it was it was in person. It was before the pandemic. And at this event, it was really great. At this event, um, I I saw Dr. Tammy Ho, who is in attendance today. And I told Tammy about stuff like, "Hey, I, I'm almost finished done with this book. I don't know who's going to publish it because I'm not academic. I didn't write in an academic way." And then, you know, Dr. Ho said. Oh, I think University of Washington Press is looking for something about, you know, HIV AIDS and Asian Americans. So let me connect you. And she connected to my eventual publisher. And one of my editors is here today, Mike Backham. And um, I always meant to ask, like, what made you take this project on? Because this is very different. Like, when I approached people, like, when I started thinking about presses, I, I, I really didn't know which academic press would even take this on. Because if you read the book, it's almost read more like, a, I call it a committee memoir. I don't call it, a, and I don't write it. In, I, my goal actually to write this book without footnotes. There, there are still a few footnotes in there. But, um, but I really just wanted to use storytelling as a way to share this history about HIV AIDS. 
So I'm always grateful for University of Washington. I feel like they, they took a risk uh, in publishing this book. And I hope, you know, this is a great way to um, just inspire other writers, ac academics to do the kind of writing that they want to do um, and in a way that really makes sense for them. So I'll set that, uh, I'll, I'll, this is sort of lineage, talking about acknowledgement through lineage, number one. Um, and I, the other thing about lineage is I really meant, and I, I'm going to put myself in the AIDS timeline because I think it's really important to understand or for me to talk about um, why I wrote this book in the first place, right? So, and I, for that, I'm going to share screen. Where is it? Okay, hold on a second. This is the inelegant transition during Zoom. Do people see this? Okay. Okay, I think this is better. So I came of age, and Crystal, top of my bio, I came to this country in the early 80s. I was almost 12 at the time. I was discovering my sexual identity. Um, and 1982, 1981, 82 is also when the AIDS crisis began, right, in this country, or at least, at least what we knew to be AIDS began around 1981. A lot of people thought that, you know, the virus actually were in the population long before that. But the first reporting of AIDS cases really started in 1981. Um, and then by 1982, the first organization, community-based organization that addressed the AIDS crisis at that time, mostly among gay men, started in 1982 in New York. So this is, I, I grew up in this era where AIDS was, especially when you are a gay, young gay man coming out, AIDS is always uh, something that's hanging over your head, right? So it kind of influenced how I thought myself about myself as a gay man. Um, it kind of influenced how I view sex, um, I did not even have sex until much later in life, even probably in my early 20s. Throughout my college years, I was celibate because AIDS was so scary to me. AIDS was made to be such a scary thing for me. So I put here so in the timeline. I just want to focus on a few things because, you know, this is not the presentation that I want to give. I want to just show that in 19, it wasn't until 1987 in Los Angeles that there is a first community effort to address AIDS in the Asian American community. And that was within a group called Asian Pacific Lesbians and Gays. And APLG was formed in 1980. So there was seven years between the founding and the beginning of AIDS until the organization started doing something around AIDS. And part of it is in response to someone, a member who died of AIDS in 1986, and he died alone. And people only found out later on that, um, that he died of AIDS. Um, well, people kind of knew, but they didn't know the other people knew. They always thought, so, so the network was so loose and the, 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 the disease was so stigmatized that there was not much community discussion around it until afterwards when people came together to talk about his death, that they realized that you know, this person needed help and the community wasn't able to come together because they didn't know that uh, each other knew about the, the, the person's status. And they, and by, on, on their own, they were too afraid to ask or to offer help. You know, not that they're afraid that they will catch HIV, but it's more afraid that like, well, how do you help someone who had been so stigmatized, right? And we, who didn't ask for help, right? So, so in response to this, a small group with an APLG started a group called AIDS Intervention Team or AIT. And you would think as a gay men's group, well, it's APLG, but it's mostly gay men. Um, it's a gay men's group, they'd be all over this. But in fact, the membership was kind of resistant to any effort organized around HIV AIDS at the time. APLG was more of a social organization um, and I think a lot of the members, uh, frankly, and it's, it's not just Asians, it's actually, you know, the sort of rumors or the jokes that, that came when I was coming up um, in the early 90s by then was that APLG was sort of this like cruising ground between Asian men and white men, right? So, so HIV AIDS didn't really uh, come up as an issue that most of the membership needed to take care, that they want to take care of. 
So AIT was a small group within um, APLG, and they were not doing stuff in the community necessarily. They were really focused on the membership. The thing is, they so they're much more insular, inward looking. Um, they are doing education of members. Uh, they are trying to like, take care of members if they fall ill. Uh, but other than that, there is not much uh, public recognition of the work that they were doing, right? So what changed was in 1991, um, these two people uh, who were activists in their own right started bringing, started infiltrating the AIDS intervention team at APLG and bringing a lot of younger generation. Now this picture was taken a few years ago. Um, so on the left, you have Rick Parrish um, and on the right, you have Joel Barakio Tan. Both of them eventually became two of the co-founders of this organization that I wrote about in the book, Love Your Asian Body. Uh, and the third co-founder is Dean Goishi, who is um, about 15 years older than they are, uh, who was the, one of the original APLG members, right? So, but these two young people at the time was in the twenties. Um, they really were looking for an issue to, as a way to organize younger queer API men and women like myself. Right? And the issue that really brought them together was this thing called AB 101. Um, AB 101 was a legislation that um, was passed by the California legislature, both houses, that would have made um, discrimination against LGBTQ people in employment and housing illegal. So at the time, the governor of California was Pete Wilson. Um, who was known to be a moderate Republican. Um, I don't think such animal exists anymore to, to today's politics, but back then it's a thing, moderate Republican. So when he was on a campaign trail be before he became governor, he, would, he promised that he would sign AB 101 if it, was, if it ever came to his desk. So in 1991, the legislature passed it, it was on his desk and then he vetoed it. And then people were so upset in the LGBTQ communities. Um, frankly, I think a lot of like uh, white gay men and lesbian just felt like this is a slap across the face. This is a, a betrayal. Um, and it might be the first time some of them felt betrayed by the establishment. Uh, so there was a lot of anger and it spilled into the street this is a began a lot of activism for a, a, a gen, that generation of um, young gay men and lesbians at the same time, um, uh, around that time. Um, in Los Angeles, those protests were everywhere. You know, the two pictures that I found from the advocate showed the AB 101 protest at UCLA, but Rick Parrish and Joel Tan, the two people I showed you in the earlier slide, in the previous slide, they actually met at the protest in West Hollywood. Joel was holding a sign called, uh, and it, uh, on the sign it has a, it's a, a picture of a volcano or painting a volcano. And then the word said, throw Pete Wilson into Mount Pinatubo, which was the volcano in the Philippines that was erupting at the time. You know, so Rick Parrish, who is both Filipino and black, saw that sign and basically rushed to meet this person um, because it was, he was another fellow Filipino who is, seems to embrace this anti-imperialist uh, politics, like who is able to combine AB 101 with some of the sort of this uh, 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 anti-imperialist politics in the slogan, right? So that's how they became friends. And they started a group called Colors United or they, with other uh, people of color too. Um, and there was an API caucus, the Asian Pacific Islander caucus within Colors United that Rick and Joel ran. And they were trying to figure out how to continue the activism that was started by AB 101. And they came upon HIV and AIDS, right? So this group of young people infiltrated or started becoming part of the AIT organization. And they just radicalized the politics. It was no longer just inward. They are doing a lot of stuff that was, um, that, that was much more confrontational, much more agitational. Eventually it caused the rift between the AIT and the parent APLG group. So AIT became its own organization, becomes an AIDS service organization called APAIT, Asian Pacific AIDS Intervention Team, uh, which still exists today. And it's really the subject of um, 
of the book that I, I wrote, Love Your Asian Body. So the title of the book um, came from the first social marketing campaign that Rick and Joelle came up with. And I'm going to tell, I'm going to let Rick tell that story. Uh, and this, by the way, but before I, I do that, this is the image of, uh, of, the, of that campaign, one of the images, right? Um, and these, this is a postcard. So I was a volunteer. I was just barely out of college. A group of us were found APIT and then use it as a way for us to do our activism. Um, and before then I was an activist, but not necessarily HIV and AIDS. Before then I was doing much more stuff around immigrant rights and workers' rights. Uh, Rodney King was huge back then. So that really shook my worldview about race politics in this country. You know, just so many things happening, right? Like Prop 187, which was an initiative that, um, that would pretty much um, uh, uh, marginalized even more undocumented immigrants that happened also in the early 90s. There's just so many things happened in the early 90s. HIV AIDS is one of them. Um, but I'm one of those volunteers that would hand out these cards outside of a bar, usually in West Hollywood, but any gay bars really. I will hand it out to uh, anyone who is presenting as Asian or Pacific Islanders and this will help them or, or try to promote HIV testing. Um, as well as uh, safer sex practices like using condoms, right? So you'll see this image at the front and then in the back, you will see uh, the number to APIT. There's no such thing as website back then. This is pre-internet. So you will see a number that where you people can find help um, and also maybe some information about where to get tested, you know? So as you can imagine, talking about HIV AIDS at a bar is not easy. People don't want to talk about death and disease when you're trying to get hooked up uh, by the end of the night. So having an images like this at the front usually at least stop people long enough for me to ask them a question or get the conversation started, right? So it's a very clever way to get people talking um, and we can talk about joy a little bit, joy and pleasure a little bit, because I think that AIDS in activism really lean into the idea of, uh, of pleasure. Like this is not necessarily the image that people associate with AIDS at the time, right? So I'm gonna play a little bit excerpt from Rick. It's about a few minutes long. And then, you know, we can go into conversation, but I just wanna give you a sense of why I love your Asian body and why this is really important. Part of the, part of the challenge was getting Asian and Pacific Islanders to get tested to begin with because when you're talking about AIDS and HIV, you're talking about sex and death and those are taboo subjects for Asians in general. And so it was a challenge, number one, to get the community to respond to its own healthcare, you know, because it was such a taboo topic. And what that did was it had a domino effect. And the domino effect was we weren't getting tested, we weren't getting counted, and we were not at the table to do our own advocacy. So one of the things that you mentioned earlier to, to combat that was this, this Love Your Asian Body campaign. Can you talk a little bit about the origin of that campaign, how you came up with the idea, and what you think the effect was? We were at a coffee house in West Hollywood, and there was this young Asian guy um, he was sitting there and he, we were all talking and, and we were kind of like boy watching, you know, the guys walking by and this, this, this Asian kid, he goes, I wish, I wish I, my nose wasn't so flat, you know, and, and my colleague, Joel Tan, he goes, honey, love your Asian body. <laughs> and I'm like, I like that. <laughs> we're going to use that. And, and just the whole idea of how in Western culture, the most, you know, what is defined as beauty, and especially in the gay men's culture, usually you see these blonde haired, blue eyed type, I don't know, Nordic gods as, as the height of, of uh, beauty, when in fact, you know, we're all beautiful. So part of our campaign was to emphasize the fact that taking care of your body and loving your body and having self-esteem that's part of of having help a healthy self-image and so we were promoting healthy self-image we were promoting loving our bodies as they are and part of that love is to get tested so that we will know what to do 
if in fact we're positive. We did a photo shoot in my apartment and we had these two guys, Eric Reyes and Keith Kasai, they were our models. And so we took pictures of them in very intimate situations. Um, and you never saw, we never saw images of gay Asian men together. They were always with, you know, with a white guy or with another race or something, but never um, us together. So that was in, in a way that was very revolutionary to even create these images, especially in a time where people were very conservative about sexuality and also afraid about sexuality. So we were probably the only organization that was actively producing erotic images of gay men together, gay Asian men together. And how, what was the response? I think that's it for this. So um, the Love for Asian Body uh, campaign actually have multiple images. So these are some of the other images that also made into postcard on some and sometimes ads in um, what we call the gay rags at the time, you know. So um, so Rick talks about like how this is kind of revolutionary because these images didn't really exist in actual, you know, popular culture, but also in our imagination, right? In, um, well, some of our imagination, not every, some people like are, are much more uh, attuned to, to this kind of ideological um, form of desire. Um, so so it's, it's, it's also kind of revolutionary in that sense. It kind of give me, as a young man developing at the time, sort of a new sense of possibility of what it means to be Asian American. And then I'm going to tie this up and then bring it and, and then and then bring it back to Crystal. Um, let me stop share. Um, and about about lineages. So when I wrote this book, I was very clear that this is not a book, even though I called it a comedian memoir, that, that this will not be just a book about nostalgia, that this is a book that will be a tool for intergenerational dialogue. Um, I think for me, just thinking about my influences. Um, and I really lean into the lesbians of color that have been writing in the 1970s, people like Audre Lorde and Gloria Ansaldua, because they talked about intersectionality. They talked about being um, a double, triple minority in their cases, or even more, uh, and not necessarily a place of victimhood, but it's actually a place of power. And that as a developing gay Asian man, that really meant a lot in terms of my possibility, my political possibility too. Um, I didn't know there were organizing, they were happening around, uh, uh, organizing by queer uh, LGBTQ men and women uh, who are in the Asian American community. And there were some examples of it. I just wasn't connected to those, to that history. So, so in my, the back of my head, I knew that having that sense of history was important. Uh, and I don't mean it in a way that like, oh, you know, look at what these great people did, these heroes and sheroes did 20, 30 years ago, we should do the same thing. And this is absolutely not what I think history should be about, right? But there's still something about empowering to be able to connect it with that lineage, right? So I really wanted to document this, but I kind of wanted to leave it to the younger generation to take what's useful from this history and leave what is not useful behind. Um, and what's useful, sometimes it's our mistakes. <laughs> it's not just what we did really well. It's the things that we don't do well, right? So, so that's the conversation that I really want to have. And thank you to Crystal. Like when we thought about this event, I was like, I don't want to be the only one talking. We brainstormed about who we could bring to the table. And Matt and Jabe just came so quickly to our collective uh, mind. So. So I'm really excited to be in conversation with them because they're doing really amazing things um, uh, in the API community, especially in the Vietnamese community and in Orange County. That's really exciting to me, right? And I have no friends who have done a lot of that work before them in OC, but they're just doing it in a way that was not possible before. So really excited to be able to you know, bring that into the conversation as well. So Crystal, do you wanna? Sure, Eric, thank you so much for that. Um 
really beautiful um, context for your for your work. So for folks who are just joining joining us, welcome. Uh, so just as a reminder, um, today's event is less of a formal book talk. So I know Eric just provided a context, but it's really sort of thinking about how Love Your Asian Body um, can be a kind of portal to different you know, discussions around HIV AIDS activism and sort of um, queer of color activisms, um, intergenerational knowledges, joy, pleasure. So I just want to provide that context. So, um, you know, I want to get, um, hold on for a second. Okay, I want to get um, James and Mads involved with the conversation. So I know there's sort of a first question that I'll offer and then maybe, um, you know, after the first question, James and Mads and Eric, feel free to riff off and ask other questions as well. I know we've brainstormed some questions together. Um, but the first question really comes from Eric and Eric really wants to hear a little bit more from both James and Mads about, um, you know, where do you draw inspiration for, um, from for your own political activism um, and community work? And, uh, you know, what are some ways in which we might transmit generational knowledges around um, activism? Um, so that is sort of an opening. Um, and maybe with James and Mads before offering um, maybe some thoughts about that question, I'm just wondering if you also just want to share a little bit about the work that you do and sort of your entry point into um, this discussion. So James or Mads, um, either either or, or both, you can start. Okay, I can start or try and I, and I can just, you know, pass it over to James. But um, I think for me, when I, when I was thinking about this question, I think when I was, uh, I was, you know, as Crystal mentioned, I went to Riverside and I feel quite lucky to have been able to go to Riverside. Like I had, you know, I was in a class with Jennifer Doyle and she was teaching the English department and, you know, she was incorporating in her like, you know, huge 203 person lectures like David uh, Buenarovitz and like, uh, and then I ended up taking a queer performance class with her and she brought in and grounded Munoz's disidentifications as a grounding text for that class and kind of in the midst of all that. And at the same time, I was online a lot growing up. I grew up in the generation that like, um, I was on Tumblr and I was like a really early adapter, I guess, of Twitter. And I met a lot of friends through these spaces that were also really beginning to like explore, um, really beginning to figure out and figure like how to name or and identify as ourselves, like what it meant to actually uh, name or disavow our genders and pronouns and really contend with like language that didn't I, that we didn't identify with or that didn't align with how we actually felt within our within and of our bodies. Um, and so kind of through this like coalescence of like that time during undergrad, I think I was really able to start challenging myself and my friends around me and kind of the ways in which we were engaging with like, you know, media and with the, each other and things that we we're reading. Um, and I think I really latched on to, you know, Munoz and I think disidentifications, I think in trying to understand the power of naming um, and and being able to ground ourselves alongside each other and learn from and with each other was really important. Um, uh, but yeah, I can I can pause there. I'm just I think that's something I was really thinking a lot about. Hey James, did you want to share as well? Yeah. Um, thank you, Eric and Krista for inviting me to be here. Um, I, I will say, I'll answer the, the question, just like how I came into my political consciousness. Um, and I think first to just growing up in a Vietnamese refugee family, um, and I think learning from my grandparents and parents, uh, real critiques of war and capitalism, um, or at least really messy critiques of war and capitalism. Um, uh, no, I'm never mind. I, I won't go there. But um, I, I think that was like my first sense of like, you know, our personal lives are intimately tied to larger structures of power and violence. And then um, I think it wasn't until college, really, in undergrad, when I got involved with pan ethnic Asian American organizing in the Bay Area, um, that I think I was given language to start describing 
my thoughts, ideology, and um, really contextualizing the experiences of myself and my family. Um, and a lot of that work, I think, was really um, centered on Southeast Asian immigrant rights, labor rights, and, and racial health disparities. Um, and I really think um, my opportunities of like interning at Southeast Asian Community Alliance in LA Chinatown at um, Lavender Phoenix, or which is formerly known as API Quality Northern California in the Bay Area, um, and interning at APAT as well. I think like being able to like learn in these different environments um, helped me grow from the older folks there, um, from organizers like Sissy, um, from Sammy Wills, um, from Jury and other folks at APAT. Um, I think really having this like on the ground praxis of, um, of organizing, but then um, at the same time, being in grad school, I think helped me, I think push my theorizing and political conscious, consciousness even more um, because I was engaging with women of color, feminist texts, queer of color critique texts. Um, you know, I think the Combahee River Collective, Kathy Cohen, Rod Ferguson, all of these really major, I think, touch points for me, um, again, gave me language to, to think about um, like embodied knowledge as like a, a queer person, um, but also a really radical sense of politics in um, critiquing like the, the very structures that are, I think, death making to, to queer folks of color every day. Um, so yeah, I, I'll, I'll kind of pause there. Thanks so much, James. Um, Eric, did you want to respond to that at all or transition to the next question? Yeah, um, I just, it, it is really interesting where we drew our political influences, right? That it's really diverse. Um, and, and I think that that's really rich, you know? Um, I think I started our project thinking that like, I'm missing something because I, I am cut off from the, the queer API history before me. Um, but at the same time, I felt like there was so much that I was able to draw from. Um, so in some way, I like I kind of, it kind of changed my thinking a little bit that, you know, it doesn't have to be lined up with your identity perfectly, right? I think the ability to um, understand how other people conceived of the struggles and so the theory behind the struggles could actually be very helpful in informing your own, right? Like that's what critical thinking is in a way, um, able to take something that might be slightly different and think about what, what worked and what didn't work. I think that's part of critical thinking that is so necessary in movement building, not just in academia. Um, and so I think that was really rich. But I, I do want to, and maybe we can go back a little bit later. I do, I do want to say that there's something that's unique about being able to draw on a lineage um, that is closer to home in a way, right? Especially as queer people, queer people of color, and that have been oftentimes uh, either marginalized or even being kicked out of our home, both in a very literal sense but also in, in, in a, a, a metaphysical sense too. So, so having that uh, grounding is also very powerful too. So but I just want to acknowledge this stuff that even in any generation that influence is, is diverse and should be diverse. Thanks so much, Eric. I know Matt has a question um, for you. Yeah, definitely. I think speaking from that specific experience where like there's so many, I guess, like fragments that we end up having to pick up something that I kept returning to um, as I was kind of really jumping around and like rereading or like reading parts of um, Love Your Asian Body um, was that I really actually like how you eased us into the book. I kept rereading this kind of this paragraph at the end of your intro um, and it goes, um, we think we forget, but there's another relationship we have with memories between remembering and forgetting. Maybe we could tell the history of AIDS only when we could do it collectively. 
And I think there was just something really especially meaningful for, for me in our ability to remember and forget together, right? And so particularly amongst queer color community histories, because as you were sharing, like we're already coercively remembered or forgotten in like very exacting ways by our families, by society, by broader communities and all these kind of intersectional, you know, identities and um, the spaces that we traverse. So I just was wondering if you could talk more about this relationship maybe between remembering and forgetting um, or just, you know, expanding more on, on, you know, what you meant when you, when you wrote that. Yeah, it's, thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. It's, it's interesting to me because um, when I ask people, and this is not just for this oral history, this is my second oral history project, even with the first one, when I approach people and say, hey, I would love to talk to you. Sometimes the response is, oh, I don't think I remember that much. Sometimes I, I, I don't think I can have much to contribute. I have many things, meaningful things to say, right? Um, and I don't, some of it may be Asian modesty. I don't know if, you, Crystal, you deal with that when you own research and people are just being really modest. Um, and, um, but a lot of times it's, it is true that maybe in the beginning when I started talking to them, they were like, oh, you know, I, I don't really remember what happened. But as they started talking, you know, they would, sit, they would, things will come up. And this is how memories work, right? Because it's buried. And once you pull the string and you start, you, you never know how long that string is going to be, uh, they allow you to pull. Um, but the other thing was also interesting too, because even though I was interviewing people individually, sometimes I would bring some information into the conversation that will help other people remember. Um, and, and this is why I call it community memoir, because it's not about one person. Um, and Sarah Shulman talks about this in her book, Let the Record Show, which is about the history of ACT UP, right? And people tend to think of ACT UP as a small group of primarily white gay men in leadership making a difference, but she will tell you that is not the case at all. That this is how we like to tell history, that it's always going to be a small group of, it, it's, it, it will, might always be small, but it's not just about a uh, hero. Like we like to look for heroes, but sometimes there are no heroes or everyone is a hero. Um, everyone's a flawed hero, right? So so I think a lot of it is it just be able to like, um, You know, people have put the story of AIDS away for so long. They have gone on with their lives. Some of them, are, most of them are not in the HIV AIDS sector anymore. So, so that is really the past. They have put that away, uh, not only what they did, but also the grief that came from what they did away. Um, so it's sometimes, of, it was very challenging to, to ask people to relay that. Right. Um, I remember talking to um, the mother and the older brother of James Sakakura, um, who is the fortunate the focus of one of the chapters because he died of AIDS in the 90s and he was a HIV worker, he was an activist, he was a poet, he was well beloved um, by the, the, the community. Um, and he is tremendously flawed. Uh, he had a history of drug addiction, um, different trips to rehab. And I was able to talk to his mom, who by the time was in her late 80s. And part of me was just so afraid to ask any question that was going to bring the grief out even more, right? Like of someone, that, uh, her, her, her son who had died 30 years before that. Um, and, but she was, she was very clear about the story, James's story. She was very candid about all his flaws um, and all the drama in the family that, 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 that the family went through, you know. Uh, they did not, um, the, 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 the reaction from the father was not great, you know, but, and, and, and she and, and James's older brother were able to tell that story uh, in such, I, I was surprised by how candid they were. And then when, when writing it, I also debated like how much, how much should I put in the book, right? Um, and just because they tell you something and sometimes people forget the, cam uh, the, the camera or the, the recorder in this case on, 
that they forget. They just end up telling the story. So did they really want this story to be told? Even though they looked at the transcript, they approved everything to be used, right? People don't know what it means when something comes out in the boat all the time. Um, it stayed with me. You know, this is such a terrible history. Um, but I think when I thought about it, this is also how James's mother continued James's legacy because James himself was very open about his addiction history, his struggle with HIV, um, his relationship troubles. He wrote about them. He talked about them as part of HIV education. Um, he kind of used himself as a cautionary tale, right? And he saved people because he was vulnerable. He would share those stories. So, um, but it's like, I'm still kind of shaking a little bit just thinking about that story. Um, so the story is really hard to tell. And you kind of, I think being together kind of gave you that courage uh, and knowing that people will receive these stories in the spirit that you give them. It's, um, I, I hope it helped, you know? Um, I was asked to write an essay about the healing power of oral history. And I told them, I don't know that. I don't know oral history is always healing. I, I, you know, I'm thinking in this case, it, I, I think it's true. You know, I have some evidence that, that it healed, but I could see it go the other way just as easily too, you know? So, and I think it's true with a lot of other struggles. Just the other day I was talking to a group of um, queer API activists about same-sex marriage, about sort of their campaign for same-sex marriage. And it's the same thing, like people say, oh, I don't remember that much, um, you know? And so I think a lot of these things have to be done in a collective way. Yeah. I really wanted to follow up on that, Eric, because um, I think in your book, you know, you balance this really fine line of honoring the stories of the folks that um, I think you're stewarding or curating um, and honoring the, the incredible work of the AIDS activists during this moment, while also not romanticizing it, like you said, like, um, and I think to hear you talk about like the candidness with which people spoke um, is really powerful. And I was wondering, like, as you were writing, like, what were the, the ethical decisions you navigated as you both honored and turned a critical eye towards these histories. Um, and this question is really motivated, um, like the, the last two chapters of the book where you talked about um, sexism that occurred during organizing during APAT um, or even um, APAT becoming more respectable as it became more like absorbed in the nonprofit industrial complex and sort of, um, like being taken away from its more radical roots. And I like those conflicts came out so vividly in the book. Um, and I, I ask these things, or I'm like really curious about them because um, in Mads and my work with VROC, uh, you know, we're navigating this uh, conflict where VROC as of two years ago has transitioned from an all volunteer model um, we were able to like do the radical work we wanted to do. And now we have st uh, paid staff and are making these, I think, or having crucial decisions and conversations about what it means to be constrained by funding um, policies, you know, funders priorities versus like our priorities wanting to sustain the lives of queer Viet folks in Orange County. Um, so I see so much resonance in these like chapters. And yeah, I wanted to ask, you know, how, how did you write about them, um, honoring and having that critical eye? Um, yeah, I think the chapter on sexism was really hard to write. Um, it's hard to strike a tone because the villain in that chapter um, was someone that I knew, uh, had made a lot of contributions to the queer men's community in Los Angeles has what I think a major misstep in this episode 
but it's happened to be the episode of the story. Like he doesn't appear anywhere else. So I was always afraid that if people read that, that's gonna be his legacy. Yeah. Um, so at the same time, I also want to, you know, call out um, that mistake because I think it's very instructive um, about the pervasiveness of sexism or male chauvinism, especially in HIV <laughs> community at the time, right? But I think in any kind of uh, co-gender organizing um, in, the, in, in queer politics, um, it's, it's still true to this day, you know? So I think it's very relevant. So I, I think what really, um, so I had to be really clear about why I'm telling the story. Um, I also had to, I think what really helped in the end is the idea of multiple truths, right? That, that, and that people could be complex just because we are all fill in someone else's story, <laughs> you know? Um, and also recognizing my, my position in, as a storyteller, you know? So I think the way I address it by just sharing what I just shared with you, like why this is such a hard story to write and basically asking reader not to trust me completely, just as we shouldn't trust any writer 100%, right? I'm just, but I am transparent about these are the sources. These are, I think, the gaps in my stories that I cannot fill. Um, and whatever books that we read, it's not going to be a complete history. There's always going to be gaps, right? So, so that's my way of addressing it. I don't, like, you know, a lot of this writing is kind of um, an experiment in a way. I, my first book, um, the first oral history, I wrote a completely different way, right? And, and at the end of the, like a few years later, I said, like, it, it felt um, there's, it, there's something unsatisfactory about the way I wrote that book, which is why I wrote this book this way, you know? So who knows? Like, I don't think I have uh, another oral history in me, but you know, the next time I write this, I might be different too. So I'm evolving as a writer as well. Um, but I think it's really helpful to understand that. Um, and for me, it's my right. So my, my job is not so much like this is the correct history. This is the version that needs to pass down. But say, hey, you know, if you were some of these women uh, uh, AIDS activists in this story, this is what you're concerned with. If you are an HIV positive activist who wanted to do this, this is how you would see this. And if you were a gay man trying to preserve a certain kind of legacy, you know, this is why you act the way you did, you know? So it's, I think it's, it's sort of a balance between empathy and critic, be also staying critical as well, you know? So, I mean, I, I did have a point of view. I was very clear about what my point of view is too. So yeah, so I'm, it, yeah. Does that answer your question? I mean, does that help with, uh, or, in your situation that you brought up with Free Rock? I think it definitely helps with my own research project. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, but yeah, no, definitely. Thank you for, for answering that. Um, well, I just want to interject and maybe offer a question that Eric offered originally and maybe circle back to it. And maybe we could start with Eric, but it's actually a question for all of you. So my question is, and again, this is really Eric's question, but um, I'm wondering, Eric, if you can share a little bit about, um, you know, you started the, uh, the talk offering sort of an overview a little bit of the 80s, but you also talked about sort of joy and pleasure and desire and those images, right? Those really um, beautiful and provocative images that you um, showed at the beginning. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that, the ways in which your interlocutors um, who are part of this community memoir really thought about joy and pleasure and desire as central to the organizing work. Because as you shared, I think often, especially for folks who might be outside of HIV and AIDS activism, they might not necessarily, um, you know, think about joy and pleasure and desire when it comes to um, HIV and AIDS activism. And maybe, so that's sort of a question I think for Eric, like I would love to hear a little bit more about that. And then maybe for, um, Mads and James, maybe an iteration or a version of that question, sort of, um, 
And I know there are a lot of students who are joining us here today, um, undergrads at, at UCR. And, um, you know, we're sort of at this, I don't know, I was in this email um, or text chain today earlier with some friends and just um, really feeling um, a lot of despair, you know, at this moment. And I keep thinking about what Adrian Marie Brown says about community organizing and sort of other folks too, that um, community organizing um, is science fiction in some ways, <laughs> because you're trying to imagine like a different mm -hmm. world and you're really believing it. It's not just imagining, you're trying to enact it. So it's like, why is joy and pleasure really central to that? Um, even as you're organizing or writing about these real structural forms of just immense harm and violence. Um, so sort of a two part question, but I wonder if maybe we can start with Eric. Sure, I have two stories to share. One is from the book and, and two, it's about the process of uh, publishing the book. Um, so the story that I would share from the book that kind of reminds me how horrible AIDS education or sex education was in the beginning part of, um, of the AIDS epidemic. This is sort of the sex education I got as a high school and college students, whose message basically was, if you catch HIV, you die. If you have sex without a condom, you die. Uh, one of the activists, the Black uh, AIDS activists that I talked to for the, in the book talked about, it's almost as if people didn't care if gay men have fun at all, you know, the way they talked about sex. Um, but the story that I will share actually came from uh, Deep Tran, who, by the way, is a UCR alum and also a good friend. Uh, who came to work for APIT after she graduated from UC Riverside. And she was attracted by the Love Your Asian Body campaign because she felt it was very liberating, even as a lesbian, you know, if, although most of the images are of gay men, uh, she felt it was, um, it was so much of about embracing of deviance. And she would tell the story and her job was, you know, prevention, right? So she had to do all these safe sex education as well. Um, but the way she did it, and I don't know where she got it from actually, but the way she did it, she used a lot of sex toys. She brought dildo, nipple clams, and whips and chains and all these things. She made sex fun. Like there are all these ways that you can engage in pleasure that it doesn't involve penetration, right? Or unsafe penetration. Um, and, and you can still have fun. You use your imagination, you use creativity, you access those things that you're not supposed to access as a goody two shoe Asian American man and woman, <laughs> but we all somehow harbor, right? So you, you, you go there, you know, so it's not just about like put it in, take it out, right? So, uh, and she tells the story about like, you know, she would have this chest of sex toys that she would carry with her um, in the back of her car, you know? Um, and then one day um, someone broke into her car and stole the chest. So she had to replace all these sex toys, but she, her thing is like, I can't imagine that deep face when they open up this chest and realize that it's a bunch of sex toys, you know. So to me, that is so emblematic of, of, of the pleasure that um, that Asian American AIDS activists try to put, try to reclaim for us, you know, um, in the in the ep epidemic where you're not supposed to even talk about sex or have sex, right. So that was really powerful to me. Um, and, and the AIDS movement in the Asian American community is full of examples of that. And, and I think it's really different from other types of uh, uh, Asian American struggles in that we really focused on fun and pleasure. Like this is not frivolous right, at all. And I, I, I like to think that it, it has some influence in how, we, how uh, the current generation activists think about self-care and not getting burned out and having boundaries and all of that, even though those AIDS activists back in the 90s didn't have boundaries either. either. They're, <laughs> they're kind of exploding boundaries. Um, the other story that I would share about pleasure is um, has to do with the publication process. Um, Mike might remember this. Um, as a writer uh, being published by the press, I had to answer this survey about like what I want the cover to be. I can dictate what the cover is, but I can have some influence about what it looks like. Um, so I said, um, it cannot be blood red because a lot of book about AIDS, it's have this blood to it. So it cannot be sad, it cannot be angry. Uh, it has to be fun and joyful. And I think if you click on one of the links that Crystal shared with you, you'll see the cover. 
And they came out with this cover that I absolutely loved, right? Um, and we also talked about like, hey, you know, I asked like if we could have one of the Love Your Asian Body image, the one that I showed you in the slide on the cover. Um, at first I was like, oh, you know, that could be a little bit racy. We're not sure. I, I think that Mike may correct me on this. I think there was some concern about censors in Canada about, <laughs> I wasn't, I don't remember that part of the conversation. It's like, oh, you know, maybe that cover won't happen. But when I got the draft back, it was the image of the Love Your Asian Body campaign, uh, maybe certain parts being obscure, which I think was done very cleverly, but you can still tell that it's a very sexy image, you know, but that's why I really wanted to emphasize. They asked me in the survey, what do you want to emphasize? That it's, it's the joy. It's, I think this is the story of AIDS movement hasn't told yet that there is so much joy and pleasure in it. It's not just about like angry white people storming the church or, you know, the NIH, although that is very important, I'm not dismissing that. Um, but there, this is a this is a different narrative. Um, I just want to give a shout out to Mike Backham, who's here from the University of Washington Press, and just for your generosity um, and support for um, Eric's book. So I just want to give a little shout out. Um, but I want to, um, you know, segue into Mads and James and just sort of um, the role of joy and pleasure in the organizing work that you do. I mean, especially not you know, limited to, but maybe even um, specifically with the Vietnamese queer communities. James, do you want to start and then we can transition to that? Sure, yeah. Um, so when I think about joy and pleasure, I I think first to my uh, like first encounter with VROC. Um, and actually, I had learned about VROC while I was working at APAT. Um, one of my coworkers was just strutting down the hallway because hallways for them were runways, not just office hallways. Um, and they like sauntered into my office and they're like, you're coming to this Thanksgiving party. I'm like, okay, I will come to this Thanksgiving party down in Garden Grove. Um, and when I got there, there's just all this music. Um, there was a corner in the house where um, these older gay Vietnamese men were playing the piano and singing really classic Vietnamese songs. Um, there were just like a bunch of other like queer Viet folks. And, and for me, that was sort of my um, first time being in a space predominantly like a bunch of queer Vietnamese folks. Um, and I was how old at the time, maybe like 24, 25. Um, it had taken that long for me to, to be in a space like that. And then there were these wonderful uh, straight moms um, who are really crucial figures in VROC or crucial people in VROC um, who have queer biological kids, but also really come and donate their time to VROC or volunteer their time in VROC and reconstitute motherhood in a way where we all end up calling them mom or ma in Vietnamese. Um, and I think like that party, I think is a really representative moment for me because it was just so joyful. Like it was just literally queer folks living, being, um, also reclaiming language. Um, I think Vietnamese language as like a, a second generation child of refugees can be um, a site of trauma, um, like being policed, how I speak. Um, and also I'm from Hue, which is the central region of Vietnam. So we speak even more different from most of the diaspora here in Southern California, who's from Southern Vietnam. Um, but then to just really see like these moms, uh, the old, we call them the older brothers, the older men, um, and the youth just really like speaking to each other in such like a um, fun, unfiltered way. Um, Eric talked about about sex, and the the gay men and have like have no filters, and these moms are just learning all sorts of things. Their jaws are like on the ground, learning about anal sex and sex toys. Um, and then they start asking questions or like, oh, what is a dildo? Like, how do you use that? Um, and it's all in Vietnamese. And so to me, like to my second generation ears, I'm like, oh my God, this is wild. Um, 
and so yeah to me like I really center those moments um, and how like that is part of the organizing, like these everyday pleasurable moments. Um, and so yeah, th thanks for the opportunity to just even remember that story and to think back on it. Thanks so much, James. Uh, Mads, did you wanna share? Yeah, while James was talking, I think I was reflecting also on some of my like first experiences around other like queer, be it people like both my age and like, uh, like mothers as well. So in 2016, um, I did this like Vietnamese organizing, uh, like intensive retreat called High Veteran School for Organizing. And it's like, across a lot of progressive Viet people. Uh, currently in our generation, I think that was like a big center, like opening point for us to really politicize and ground ourselves as Vietnamese leftists. But for me entering that space in 2016, that year, like one, like the uh, participants had doubled in size, so from 15 to 30, which is my year. And then also most of us were queer. And that was like a big first time for, for this, uh, for this training workshop weekend. And so it really became present and shifted a lot of the conversations that probably wouldn't, that were, that wouldn't happen prior to that year. And I think to like meet other queer Viet people, I think allowed me just to, to talk more openly about it. And they had uh, introduced me to like other ways that they had gathered um, intentionally as queer Viet people beyond this kind of organizing space. And a lot of it was intergenerational and it, it wasn't like reliant on like agendas and outcomes and goals and all these kinds of things that a lot of like, especially nonprofit and organizing spaces really center on like, oh, we need a campaign. We need to do all these things. And I think a lot of their gatherings were just centered on building relationships with each other, learning how to love and care for each other and laugh with each other. Um, one of these spaces is called uh, which is like gathering to eat and practice Vietnamese together as young people that like James was mentioning, like that we don't often get to practice amongst each other or we're shamed for. And I think in amongst one of these, um, uh, these gatherings in the Bay Area specifically, a lot of there's a lot of cool um, queer and trans folks in the Bay Area. And I'm thinking about like, uh, Cutie Viet Cafe, who centers like they're organizing around food and performance and doing things around art. Um, but they like brought in their mothers as well. And I think for me, that was like the first time I had seen like mothers talking to their children and loving them for, for, for being them, like without, and I think something that was also great for me as like someone that's non-binary where I just never really super felt comfortable. Like, I think as I came into claiming being non-binary, like I didn't feel like any of the pronouns that were allotted to us in English ever fit. And so I had met a friend beyond this space that didn't use pronouns. And I thought for me, like, oh, that's actually perfect. And in Vietnamese, when you talk about yourself or with others, you don't have to use a pronoun. You can actually talk about yourself in third person. I thought that was really, it just like felt right. And so I think to even have that was like, I think huge. And even to like experiment with the language as well, something that a lot of queer Viets had come up with at the time was like this combination of like the, the, um, the sister and the brother pronouns so instead of J for for a woman and and for for men they put it together and made it Jan which is uh, when you put that together it actually turned into the word for like lemon um, and so you know a lot of us had like made you know puns and jokes around this and um, yeah and so kind of expanding from that I think they had like performances and just to seeing the kids performing on stage like us people like doing poetry and the mothers laughing along with us, I think was like such a huge like moment for me and that like, you know, a lot of our relationships were centered around like caring for each other and just like really knowing each other, I think also mobilized us to do work together, right? Because our relationships were like bound by our care for each other rather than like our political commitments and eventually those things collided, right? Um, and so that's kind of, and so, I, yeah, I think having these spaces being like a vehicle to like move us forward is like always a possibility because we care about each other beyond like kind of 
beyond the world that is constantly inflicting harm upon us and like, you know, through our communities and stuff. So, yeah. That's so powerful. Um, thank you so much for sharing that, Maz and James, and um, just thinking about uh, the potency of language and naming. Um, it's really powerful. Um, I have one last question before we transition into a conversation with our audience, but I also, um, Eric, did you have any questions or um, any response before we transition? Um, yeah, I, I have a question. We don't have to get to it. Um, it would be lovely to hear from the audience because I can also get the answers from Matt and James you know, after today. But I always tease, uh, not, I, not always, but I've teased James a couple of times now that as he's getting older, now he has a generation behind him, right? And um, just thinking about how he was able to use the past, what is it that and then for maths too right and it's just like because you you deal in that memory you deal in archives as well like how do you what do you preserve from what you're doing now that you think uh would help the next generation right what some of the and even if you have an answer i mean some of the some of the considerations that you're making um will be helpful right because i think this is this is sort of my my kind of obsession right now like you know as someone um who is queer who don't always have that lineage like these conversations these relationships are great so how do we keep going right um so that's just something that we can put a pin in it and, and get to the the next question we can do that but mads or james do you want to respond you don't have to respond with the answer per se or you can if you want before we segue so I think I'll just put a teaser out there. Um, one way that VROC is addressing really this like transmission of uh, knowledge across generations is um, we're embarking on our own oral history project. Um, and we're so lucky to, that Mads is here and you know we get to learn from folks like Eric and Crystal. Um, but yeah, I mean, we want to collect and archive uh, queer and trans Vietnamese history across multiple generations so that it's there for younger folks to learn from um, and hear from in, in multiple ways. Um, and I'll just give a quick little story. Um, a large part of why this project is happening too is we had a picnic event where um, a high school youth was really surprised that this 60 year old gay Vietnamese man existed. <laughs> he was like, oh my God, I didn't even know you could that there, this was a thing. Um, and so, you know, our Gen Z folks were coming for you. Thanks, James. Uh, Mads, did you want to respond or? No, I mean, I think it was like in the same vein where it's just like, I don't know, I feel like just more intergenerational spaces like this picnic and just these social spaces, just I think having more intentional space to just like be together and see that we all exist, I think is already so, do, does so much. And I don't know, I was just laughing as, as Eric was talking, because I think back to some of the youth I've worked with and they've started to call me like a yelder, which is like a young elder. And I was like, okay, I'm not even that old, <laughs> okay. Um, but it's like that these there, but it for me, it's like registering that they're like, that we're all learning from each other and that they're willing to learn from me as like even a, a younger, older person, I don't know. <laughs> um, but that just that these kinds of spaces as, as they coexist and as we all kind of are together, I think is is already just so moving. So yeah. And I think that's so important, Mads, in terms of what you shared, because we think we often think about that transmission as like older to younger, but it's actually mutual. It's really dynamic, you know, in terms of um I learned so much from, from my students as well. So I'm, I'm really glad that you shared that. So I have a lot of questions, but I actually want to open it up to our audience. Um, so feel free to, um, I actually think that the easiest way might be to actually share the question um, in your chat um, and um, we can move from there. But are there any questions that folks want to offer or comments um, for Eric, Mads and James? Don't be shy.
So maybe to start us off, I have a question for Eric. Um, and this actually um, dovetails a little bit with Mads and um, with Mads and James to share. And actually, your question for Mads and James. So this might be a question that um, all authors hate to get, but I have to ask it. Um, so Eric, you shared that, um, you know, I know in our conversation for planning for this event, you shared that you really wanted the way that you imagined this book was that it would be a portal in a, in a way, right, to have these kinds of conversations around how do you actually share these kinds of knowledges, you know, around these particular subjects that are just so important, but that can be really difficult to share, you know, across generations. Um, like 10 years from now, um, how would you like your book to be shared? Oops, sorry about that. Sorry about that. Um, how would you like your book to be shared? Um, like, how do you imagine it um, used? And I think part of this is not just about like people buying your book, but like I often think about um, like oral history as not only a form of like creating records, but actually relationships, right? That oral history is actually um, a beginning point to create relationships with one another. Um, so I'm just curious in terms of if you can imagine how your book will circulate and be shared? Are there particular ways in which you would like it shared, whether it's in the classroom or beyond um, Beyond that? Yeah. Um, I don't know. It's kind of funny, but I talked about this, I think one of the social media posts that as, as I, I, I always want, wanted to do this to be it's a generational tool and then I realized that I'm writing a book, so which is not the great, the, it's not the greatest intergenerational tool. Um, but I think one of the things that I want this book to be used is um, changing maybe Asian American movement narratives. I just have this email exchange, or actually text exchange with Joel Tan, one of the other co-founders. Um, he was responding to one of the social media posts and I said something that really piqued his interest. And what I said was, I don't think Asian American communities fully embraced or understood the impact of the AIDS movement had on the community. It's, and it's not just HIV AIDS, it has so much impact on arts and culture, it has so much impact in public health. Um, and I don't there's, think there's a recognition of it. Um, I'm thinking like if you ask people, you know, name a LGBTQ Asian American Pacific Islander organizing moment, most people would say same sex marriage. Um, while that is a very important struggle, um, it's, I felt like as a movement, like the AIDS movement had a lot more legacy. You know, I think we're still trying to figure out what the legacy of the same sex marriage is. <laughs> Frankly, a lot of organizations that have been really active during same-sex marriage uh, just end up pivoting so much because it was it was not a it, there were so many flaws with that with, the, with that movement. Uh, I'm thinking about like um, if you have if you look at anthologies around Asian American movement, HIV AIDS probably wouldn't show up. Um, I and mean, you look at the Asian American series that Nate Tajima Pena did, which is very good, which was very good, but again, no HIV and AIDS, you know? So, so I really think that um, there needs to be some recognition. And Joelle asked me, why do you think that is? I said, well, it's a good immigrant, bad immigrant. You guys were the bad immigrant. You guys were the one who wielding the dildos, you know, so, and, and, and disrupting. And, and not that there's not disruption, the moment of disruption in the Asian American movement, there certainly is, but not in the way that really like celebrate that kind of deviance. You, you, and, and so we are victims of our own modern minority myth too. So, um, you know, and I, and I, I just saw Free Chose to Lead, but with Crystal, the other day I was thinking like, it's the same thing. Like there's not a book written about Chose to Lead because it's such a flawed hero, if you will, right? So like we, we still have to get over that hero narrative uh, in our own communities. And I'm hoping this will help in that trajectory. Mm, thanks so much, Eric. Eric and I just watched a film about Chul Su Lee, who was incarcerated um, during the 1970s. So that's who Eric was referring to. So there are two questions. Hopefully we can get back, we can get to both. We might not be able to, but uh, the first question is from Kylie. And I'm so sorry if I'm pronouncing your name incorrectly, but I'm just reading in the chat. We talked about some improvements within the sphere and, and within recent time, but what do you all think are some past mistakes we have made that can be changed in the future in regards to the movement 
and I'm guessing that this might be specifically to HIV and AIDS, um, and people pushing for the movement. Understanding that although you may have good intentions, sometimes the actions you display do not reflect that, or the consequences of sometimes, um, the consequences sometimes um, strong polar ideals actually can hurt the community. So I guess, Eric, the question is sort of, are there any um, mistakes or lessons learned, I guess? Yeah, I, I, well, I think the lessons learned, I, I, I love mistakes because that means you're experimenting. And if you learn from them, that's great, you know? So, and an AIDS movement, essentially it's a youth movement of people who didn't know what, what they could do. There was no blueprint. They had to figure it out. That's how Love Your Asian Body came about. Like you heard from Rick, you know? So um, that was a mistake. Right. <laughs> um, and but I also want to maybe set it up in a way that maybe Matt and James can participate in this conversation, in, in this question too, because I feel like, especially in the queer via community, there have been generation transmission, right? There is this, there's some legacy from GVA and Omoy that was organizing in Orange County that, you know, I think you know, James kind of referenced, you know, early on. And, and it's not all like one heck big happy family, you know, so there are things that like, that I'm sure Matt and James won't do anymore or will be very cognizant of because of what happened in the past. So I do think things do, you know, we, but we make new, new mistakes too, and, but that's okay. Like we, I don't expect the next generation to be perfect. You know? Matt and James, do you want to respond at all? <laughs> Sure. Oh, go, oh, ahead. go ahead. No. Go ahead. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I would say that like probably the, the biggest lesson we've learned, like B Rock as the like latest iteration of this queer um, Vietnamese genealogy. Um, it's more like in your face politics, uh, more like confrontational, agitational. Um, and I think also like more intentional about building uh, like multiracial, cross-racial coalitions. Whereas I think Omo and GVA, which were really founded in like late 90s, early 2000s, is a different time, um, was very much about building community within and just really having a safe space for folks to be, like Omoy being the group for uh, Vietnamese lesbians, trans femme folks, uh, trans women, um, and then Gay Vietnamese Alliance or GVA being that group for gay Vietnamese men. Um, and so a lot of the services or like programming that they did was really just for themselves. And I think with B Rock and how we were formed, which was in response to um, the Little Saigon uh, Lunar New Year parade, barring queer and trans Vietnamese folks from marching in the parade, it was like, we have to be public. Um, we can't be in our cocoon anymore, which I'm not dismissing the importance of that kind of development. Um, but I, yeah, because of like a different time and a different circumstance in the formation of the group, um, we are much more public with our politics and just who we are now. Matt, did you want to respond? Yeah, I think lately I've thinking, I've been thinking about like two things, like one, like conflict that often emerges within like interpersonally across community members that kind of have the potentiality to like disrupt movement work, right? And then also like being able to like, how can we actually be like, how can we have generative conflict? How can we engage our, our the conflicts that we have amongst each other around our politics and things like that and kind of beyond in order to arrive at a space together to still continue to build. And I think something that I really learned in working, especially with like um, kind of the older first generation Vietnamese people is that like, like even if we might not have like perfectly aligned politics, learning that there's still a way to work together, that like we don't have to be in alignment in order to work together, that we can meet each other somewhere in the middle. Um, and, and again, like continue to learn from each other because at the core of a lot of our work in organizing, whether that's like B-Rock and like kind of the broader Vietnamese community as well. It's like, we can't constantly, like James is saying, like be in your face about, oh, we're leftists, we're X, Y, and Z. Like that's not important. It's like about how we take care of each other. Like, 
because there's so much violence kind of constantly in our atmosphere, right? And so how do we continue to kind of work through that friction, right? In a way that it's that, that, that yeah, that's generative. Thank you so much, Mads and James. So I'm gonna end it with a question that um, is actually provided by Professor Tammy Ho. Tammy, did you want me to read it or did you wanna read the question out loud? I can read it too, or, okay, let me read it. So this is from Tammy, this is just in the ch um, chat. Um, do any of you see any overlap, continuity or links between AIDS activism and our community building in the 90s and early um, 2000s and Asian American um, queer responses to uh, current COVID pandemic and heightened um, xenophobia? So I know um, Jeffrey Chang who's based um, in the Pomona colleges and Scripps College has written a little bit about this too, but, um, Eric, James, and or Mads, any thoughts about um, that question? It's a great question. Yeah. I'd be curious what Jifei say, <laughs> said. Um, yeah, I don't have a perfect answer to that question. I don't think I know enough to, to say where the, where the link is. Um, I will say that I think one of the differences in, in the political landscape for me is just how integrated queer APIs have been in different struggles that is just not limited to the, to the identity. You know, so if we look at um, a lot of stuff around decarceration, abolitionist movement, you see a lot of queer people leading and, you know, um, and I think not just, this is not just in API communities. When you look at Black Lives Matter, for example, the leadership is very queer <laughs> as well. You know, so I think, think there's a little bit more maybe to what James was saying, that it's not so insular anymore. It's not about just like having a safe space anymore. It's really like living that queer slogan, right? Like we're queer, we're here, get used to it. You know, so I, I, I think this generation was, it's really living what we were uh, imagining in that science fiction way that you talked about Crystal early on. Thanks so much, Eric. Mads or James, do you want to respond before we close? I'll just say one thing, I think being situated in, in public health, something I've really noticed is the, the failures of, of public health, like as like an arm of the state and actually enacting out its mission, which is to care for populations, right? And um, when I think about like queer and feminist interventions into public health, I think back to AIDS activism and I think about how queer folks during the pandemic have created their own infrastructures of care that don't rely on the state. Um, and so that that is like a very clear through line that um, I wanted to, to highlight because I think at the end of the day, people unfortunately know that we have to care for each other because the, the state definitely won't and instead is kind of bent on doing the exact opposite. Um, so yeah, I think infrastructures of community care as opposed to like public health as an arm of the state is, um, yeah, a, a definitely a continuity. That's so powerful, James. And actually the article that I just shared, um, it's actually co-written between Jafei Chang, Claudia Garriga Lopez is actually exactly on that practice of care, thinking about infrastructures of care that we have to create for one another and sort of learn lessons from that, including between um, thinking across HIV AIDS act activism, um, Black Lives Matter, um, as well during um, a time of um, the pandemic. But um, so we're at our time, um, 3.30 uh, Pacific Coast time. Um, so I just wanna thank, all of our incredible um, interlocutors, Eric, Mads, and James for joining um, for this um, you know, really generative conversation. It was just so enjoyable. I actually had a lot of joy <laughs> and pleasure as well, just hearing all of you um, speak and share. And again, Eric, just thank you so much for your incredible body of work that you've created. I know Eric and I have had conversations around um, his body of work and sort of, that spans from fiction to nonfiction, oral history, just um, so important. Uh, so thank you for your work, Eric. And thank you everyone for joining us. Um, I hope you have um, an amazing rest of the afternoon. Thanks so much, everyone.